This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. Gyms in Connecticut remain open, but how we exercise has changed because of safety guidelines and the pandemic. Coming up, we hear from a fitness instructor about how she's working with clients while still taking coronavirus precautions. Now, do you still go to a gym or do you Zoom into a fitness class these days? We want to hear from you. And later, if you've had COVID, it can be challenging to get back to exercising. We talk with a physical therapist from Gaylord Specialty Healthcare. First, the new year brings a new deduction out of your paycheck. The wage will go into Connecticut's paid family and medical leave program, so workers can get paid time off for a variety of situations. Joining us now on Zoom with more is Andrea Barton-Reeves. She's CEO of the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. Andrea, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Thank you for having me again. Now, if our listeners have questions about how this program will be working and what to expect that's coming out of their wages, they can join us at 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can also share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. And so, Andrea, we know that the Paid Family and Medical Leave Program passed into law in 2019. So how is this program going to work starting January 1st? So it works in two phases, Lucy. The first is in 2021, where, as you said, employees, uh, sole proprietors and self-employed who have those, those two categories have the option of participating, will contribute one half of 1% of their wages to the Paid Leave Authority Trust Fund. Then once that fund is uh, funded, then in 2022, benefits will be available to those that have contributed and those that meet the qualifications for paid leave, and there are a variety of reasons why people can apply for leave if, if they are indeed eligible to do mm-hmm. so. Now, when you talk about benefits, uh, tell us uh, how much mm-hmm. leave could an actual Connecticut worker take? So in most circumstances, a Connecticut worker will be able to take up to 12 weeks of paid leave for a variety of reasons. If you are experiencing incapacitation or difficulty during your pregnancy, there's an additional two weeks that are available There's also an additional number of weeks that are available for military families that are caring for someone who's been injured in active duty. Those families can take up to 26 weeks of leave in a 12 month period, but only 12 weeks of those leave of that leave is actually paid. So some of the reasons for leave, including creating or expanding your family through birth, adoption, or foster care, for your own serious health condition or that of a family member, for pregnancy, as I mentioned, with an additional two weeks that may be available. There's also leave available for caring for a family member who's been injured during active duty. And that is for both uh, physical uh, recovery and behavioral health recovery. There's also qualifying exigency leave so that a family can be present when a member of the military is being deployed overseas. And finally, what is unique to our law is that there's up to 12 days of leave that's available for those that are impacted by family violence uh, in concurrence with our family violence leave laws in the state. So a lot of different situations when we think about a paid leave, Andrea, uh, when we think about the one half of 1% coming out of a worker's paycheck, can you talk about um, how that's a sliding scale depending on uh, the wages someone makes? Sure. So on our website, which is uh, www.ctpaidleave.org, there's actually a contribution calculator that employees can use. And you can enter your wage amount at at any level, so your annual wage or weekly wage, and it will will estimate the one half of 1%. So if you make, for example, $40,000 a year, you're going to contribute about $200 a year to the fund overall, so it's a very small amount. And then the amount of benefit that you can receive can be a sliding scale as well up to uh, 95% of your weekly wages would be available to you uh, through the paid leave program, through a formula that is set in the statute. You're hearing Andrea Barton-Reeves. She's CEO of the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. As we talk about the paid leave program that begins in Connecticut on January 1st, benefits won't be paid out until 2022, but uh, you will start seeing uh, a a small deduction out of your paycheck. Now, who is exempt from this, Andrea? 
So the exempt categories of employers include those that are obviously the federal government. We have no uh, control over those employees. Some state workers, meaning those that are within a union and a bargaining unit, municipalities and locals and local and regional boards of education are generally exempt as well. The exceptions to those two categories of exemption, meaning municipalities and local regional boards of ed, is if their bargaining units determine that they can, in fact, participate, then they will do so. They can vote to participate. And if they do, then the entire workforce is then in the program. Uh, the only exception that is completely exempt are those that work for non-public secondary and elementary schools. So essentially, the independent schools and the private schools are exempt. Now, if you have a question about uh, this program, you can join us, 888-720-9677. Again, that's 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. How does our program stack up with other states that have had uh, paid leave for some time, Andre? I think we're now the 10th. We are actually the seventh state. We we were the seventh seventh state and a few have followed us. So we were a little early and there is an entire swath of states essentially in the middle of the country who are considering some form of pay leave. And we know that Colorado was the most recent state to pass the pay leave law. Our our, uh, program stacks up pretty substantially against others. It's similar in some ways in that every program has been funded first in year one, and then benefits were available in year two. The only exception to that was the state of New York, which has a slightly different structure than ours. And so that that one wasn't necessarily a sort of a funding year one and a benefits availability year two, but every other state that's set up has been that way. We have uh, one of the most generous benefits that are available up to the 95% of wages, as I had mentioned earlier. We have uh, some of the most expensive qualifying reasons for these and we also have the most expensive definition of family. So it isn't just those that we would normally consider a family, our, our parents, our siblings and the like, but it, it will, our law also includes those with whom you have such a close affinity that you would consider them family. So we've all had aunties that we weren't necessarily related to by blood, but we've known them our whole lives. Or we may have a foster sibling that we grew up with, you know, or a best friend that we've known since we were five that we consider a sibling to us. Uh, with the appropriate documentation and proof, those people would be considered family under the law, and you could be able to take some time off to take care of them as well. Now, you mentioned that our program is more expansive than in other states, but I'm wondering, like, what is the impact on businesses? Because in the lead up to mm-hmm. this being passed in our state, there was some concern from the business community about the impact. So tell us a little bit more about um, how you see this impacting employers. So the way that I see it impacting, especially small employers, and I have a particular sensitivity to small employers. I, uh, I'm a lawyer by training, and I had my own solo practice for a number of years, so I really do appreciate when new laws are passed, how they can directly impact your business. I, I totally get that. So what's new for small employers is that the current family medical leave law on either the state or the federal level only apply to employers either at 50 employees or 75 employees. And when this law comes into uh, into its full existence in 2022, it will affect employers with one employee or more. So that means that there's an entirely new world that small businesses have to navigate. And we at the Paid Leave Authority have been doing our best to educate the small business community so that they can understand what their rights and responsibilities will be. And we'll continue to do that as long as we need to and as long as the community needs us. The greatest concern we hear is if people are paid for their leave, they'll probably take more advantage of it and they'll take it more frequently and they'll take it for longer periods of time. And they may even take it for some of the close affiliation family members that I spoke of. Mm. Uh, But the reality is that in other states, we'll take Washington State as an example that has a program that's as close to ours as possible. The statistics just simply don't bear that out. There, there isn't necessarily an uptick in leaves prior to being paid versus leaves that are after they're being paid. Nothing so significant that we have a, an entire swath of people that are just running out to, to take leave. And in some states, as a matter of fact, the 
the impact is actually the opposite, is that people are still taking the leaves, but they value their job, so they, they want to come back. And this ability to be able to be able to take time, get paid, and come back is really what workers really value. I know for small employers, the other issue is, how am I going to replace the people while they're away? Uh, and so while I would never presume to tell an employer how to run their business, especially a small employer, this is a significant concern, which is one of the reasons that there's a, a you know, sort of a year long run up to when the leave actually begins. It is in part to fund the paid leave fund, but it's also in part to help small employers begin to plan for this process because it really will be a reality for them. I know that workers are taking time off now. Um, and in some cases where there's specializations, it might be very difficult to find someone. So now would be the time to really start thinking about that. As I said, I wouldn't presume to be able to solution that for anyone, but I would say that we have a deep sensitivity, a concern to it. We're here to help and we recognize it and we, we don't want to leave them out on their own. Again, you're hearing Andrea Barton-Reeves, the CEO of the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority, as we talk about a new deduction that will come out of workers' paychecks as the state now joins others with a paid family and medical leave program. Again, those benefits won't get paid out until 2022. Now, uh, we do know that um, the state Republicans in the Connecticut General Assembly have asked the governor to delay the start of the paid leave programming program. Incoming House Republican leader, Representative Vincent Candelora, joins us now on the phone to explain. Representative Candelora, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So we had uh, Andrea kind of lay out how this program is set up and what uh, people can expect uh, starting January 1st. But I'm wondering uh, why uh, you and some of your colleagues are asking uh, for this program to be delayed. Yeah, I mean, basically, we when the law was passed, uh, I think there was no anticipation that the state of Connecticut and the nation would be in the situation that it's in, you know, with this worldwide pandemic. And what we've just seen over the last six months is businesses that have really struggled, and, and some more than others, in having to come up with uh, compliance to sector rules to mitigate the spread of the virus. Every day those rules change. Uh, we are currently right in the height of a second wave, and many employers have reduced people's salaries, reduced bonuses, um, or many have lost their job altogether. And so we just don't believe that it's a good time to begin taking more money out of people's paychecks for a benefit they can't even utilize a year from now. Uh, right now I was reading that two-thirds uh, of our residents are living paycheck to paycheck. And so from an employee perspective, I'm not sure uh, it's a good time to take money out of their, their wallets and from an employer perspective, I'm not sure it's a good time to try to add a program right now um, that they really aren't focused on. And penalties are associated with it if, if they fail to comply. So what we are asking for is just a simple temporary suspension, you know, whether it be 90 days or, or six months, uh, so we could get through this pandemic uh, before we start implementing this program. Mm. Now, you talk about a, a temporary delay. I, you know, we've heard from Governor Lamont and other uh, of your colleagues in the Connecticut General Assembly on the Democratic side, Representative Candelora, that says now more than ever, uh, people need um, you know, this kind of stability, uh, whether or not, uh, you know, the, depending on their wages, uh, being reduced. But the fact that they would still get paid leave in another year if you delayed it a few months, I mean, the program would start even later, and so many people are still struggling and want to have that job security as well if they need to take time away? Well, that's, that's not necessarily the case. If we delayed it for 90 days, it doesn't mean you delay the benefits as well. We are just asking mm -hmm. for those payments to be delayed. You know, right now the federal government put forth a uh, CARES Act, which provides for paid family medical leave uh, for most employees. They qualify right now under covid so the need that they really have is being fulfilled immediately by the federal law. And what we should be doing is asking for an extension of that law. Employers are using it now. It's been very successful. Uh, as a business owner, I've had to utilize it. It's a 100% payroll deduction. Um, so there's no cost to the employer or the employee at this given time. That's what we could, should continue to push for. 
And this program, I just think it's prudent to delay it 90 days, especially given that there are penalties uh, associated with an employer failing to comply. And I think a lot of people aren't even paying attention to the fact that it's supposed to be going into effect, you know, about three weeks from now. Um, I do see that we're going to have a lot of problems with its implementation. Just because of that reason alone, it's not... It's not penetrating through the surface. Everyone's concerned about COVID and keeping their businesses open. They're not even thinking about how to administer another payroll tax. Mm. Let me bring back Andrea Barton-Reeves into the conversation to address some of the concerns you raised, Representative Candelora. Let's talk about uh, the question of penalties for employers, Andrea, um, that um, aren't implementing this in the right way. So talk through with us, you know, what are some of the ways that you're helping to inform employers this is starting and could penalties be something that is uh, suspended at least for the first couple of months as people kind of get on and learn what the process is? Sure. So we've been informing employers since April, and we've held over, at this point, about 60 webinars throughout the state. It's obviously because of COVID, we can't travel. That would be preferable, of course. We've also partnered with some of the largest chambers of commerce in the state and some of the largest business associations. So we today, as we sit here, we do have over 6,000 businesses that have registered at the Pay Leave Authority site. So I do respectfully disagree with Representative Candelora in that the message is not penetrating. We do receive a number of questions and uh, inquiries through our Contact Us feature at the site with respect to registration and a number of questions that continue to come in uh, and registrations that continue to grow. With respect to penalties, the statute does speak to the fact that the paid leave authority has the the right and the authority to impose penalties on employers that don't comply. But I know that we have said publicly and repeatedly that it's not our intent to impose these penalties immediately, that our, our initial goal is to help employers become better educated and to do that outreach. And we've done individual outreach and group outreach so that employers are educated and aware uh, because it is true that it's very difficult to hear virtually any message that isn't COVID related right now for obvious reasons. But but even in the midst of that, we continue to uh, encourage employers to come to the site and to register. And we are, we have not uh, told any employers that we're imposing penalties on them. Uh, we're trying to, at this point, really try to educate everyone. The, the challenge though, I would say this with respect to not registering right now or not withholding the one half of the 1% is that by statute, not our statute, but the uh, Department of Labor laws and statute is that employers can't then go back if they don't withhold on time and collect that money from uh, employees that that it's impermissible by law. And that's why we're telling employers that the penalty isn't necessarily one that's imposed by us. Uh, In particular, it is the law that says that you can only go back so far and take money out of people's paychecks if you fail to do it within a certain period of time. And we don't want any employer to be in that circumstance. We just don't. So we'll continue to, to educate, educate, educate as much as we possibly can. Uh, so the, those would be the those are essentially the our responses to those particular concerns, which we we hear quite often. And we certainly understand. Mm. Can I ask how much the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority is expecting uh, will be in this fund this first year? A point that Representative Candelora made uh, with people uh, on unemployment, with wages being reduced. I mean, how much mm. money needs to be collected this first year, Andrea, for people to see benefits? Uh, as expected come next year? Yeah, so there are varying levels that are expected to be received into into the fund. The, the general number is about $400 million. And what I should say though, Lucy, is that we did have an actuarial analysis that was conducted and published and available in October that outlined what the scenarios would be if we remain in the economic crisis in which we all find ourselves because of COVID and then went from what we would consider now, which is really our our worst case scenario to a full recovery of our economy and what those numbers would look like. So even throughout uh, all of those scenarios, even in our 
current economic environment, which we all agree is far from ideal, the fund remains solvent and there would be enough money to be collected and enough money to pay benefits in the first year. What, what it affects, what our, what our very high unemployment rate affects is the reserves, which means the amount of money we would like to have available if we, uh, for example, have a few more claims than, to, than, than uh, we would anticipate. But there's not a circumstance under which the fund would not be solvent as we sit here today. Hmm. Representative Candelora, is that something that you're concerned about as well? Well, obviously going forward, I'm, you know, it, it remains to be seen whether or not the program having the most generous benefits and the most expensive definitions in the country will remain solvent once it starts getting utilized. I think many people are skeptical that the money will be able to fund all of those benefits. But, but having said that, we have roughly, I think it was just said, 6,000 businesses registered with the program. Connecticut has over 300,000 small businesses throughout the state. So the thought that we have a mere fraction of those businesses that are registered to start this program that should be registered should be sounding off the alarm bells for the administration to say, you know what, maybe we aren't getting this message out here enough. Maybe we do need to put put a pause on this. This program can't fail. You know, it's something that it was the Democrats' initiative. Um, It's the law of the land. They should want it to succeed. And I'm pretty concerned and convinced that this is not going to be a clean rollout, given where we are in the middle of a pandemic. And, you know, it, it's, 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 we're all coming from different perspectives. You know, I own a business. I'm, I'm a, a full-time employer. And um, we've had to shut down several times over this pandemic. Currently, we're completely closed. So I understand the stresses that employers are going through. Our state employees have not had that kind of impact. So they're continuing to get their paychecks. They're continuing to be able to go out and leave. They continue to have health insurance. So I don't think there is an appreciation for the gravity of where our economy and our employees and employers' minds are right now. And so that's that's our concern. A 90-day pause you know, could have roughly you know, 30 or $40 million impact to the program, but it's not going to destroy the program. It's merely just going to delay it. Before I let you go, Representative Candelora, uh, again, Governor Lamont, House Speaker Matt Ritter have said they don't want to see this delayed. So how will your caucus bring this up in the regular session? Well, I think if it doesn't get delayed by January 1st, uh, it's going to be very difficult to put a pause on it. So I'm not sure that'll be the topic for the session. Um, The topic may then become, you know, keeping a close eye on it to make sure that it remains solvent. Uh, so that it is, a, it is a workable benefit for the employees because nothing could be worse than taking money out of employee pockets and then a year from now finding out they have a, a weakened benefit that they had anticipated and that they paid for. Representative Vincent Candelore again is the incoming House Minority Leader in the Connecticut General Assembly. Thank you for joining the show. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Andrea, I wanted to get back to you because we got a question from a listener. Uh, She writes that she's a full supporter of the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act, and she was wondering how to find out if the company you work for is opting to contribute to this program, and if the company you work Mm -hmm. for is not contributing, is there an option on a personal level to contribute? So thank you. That's an excellent question. If you you work for uh, an employer that has one or more employees, uh, there isn't an option. It's actually a mandatory requirement to participate in the program. So your employer should be withholding that one half of 1% as it would be uh, contributions to uh, FICA, Social Security, and the like uh, as part of the regular withholding from paycheck. If your employer is not participating, and I, I'd really like to clarify the difference between registering for the program and participating. The registration is something that we ask employers to do so that we, we know at the pay leave authority that they're participating. We could also have, and we know this, a, a vast number of employers who are withholding the one half of 1%, but who have not yet registered. So while that number, which is only in a month, uh, shows us who's registered, it doesn't necessarily tell us all, everyone who's participating. That will be a number that we'll know after uh, January 1. If you, if you need to know whether or not your employer is participating, You should simply uh, ask them if they know about the one half of 1% and send them to our website. Uh, And we're happy to support you um, if you'd like to participate, but you should be doing it through your employer. Mm. 
that would be the appropriate way to do it. And we'll uh, share a link on our website at wmpr.org slash where we live uh, to uh, more information, uh, Andrea. Uh, Before we let you go, uh, just to clarify Mm -hmm. again, this program in Connecticut, the wage benefits will be paid out in 2022. Meanwhile, if people need to take time away, if they're sick or someone, then their family is sick, if there's an adoption or, or birth of a child, they still need to rely on the unpaid federal program, but that only that's only eligible for certain people, right? What happens if you're on minimum wage, you're out of luck? That's right. That's right. So right now you're only, well, I appreciate Representative Candelora's uh, response with respect to the federal act and COVID. COVID, those acts don't cover any of the reasons that you just articulated. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, a state import, well, those, the Connecticut workforce, I should say, would still be reliant on federal family medical leave and concurrent state family medical leave both of which would cover all of the reasons that you identify um, birth, serious health condition and the like, but none of that leave is paid unless you have some accrued time, a vacation, a sick or PTO of your own. And that's why the paid leave program is transformational. And while we understand that there's a call for a delay, the longer we delay is the longer that those benefits don't uh, become available for people who we know and communicate with us regularly really desperately need that support so that they can care for their families and also continue to be a part of our workforce. Andrea Barton-Reeves, again, is CEO of the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. That website that we just mentioned, ctpaidleave.org, that can help answer questions you have about the program. Uh, Andrea, thank you for breaking it down for us, and we'll probably check in with you uh, probably next year to see how it's going. Thank you. appreciate the opportunity. This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Coming up, do you belong to a gym? What does your workout plan look like these days as COVID cases rise in our state? We're going to hear from a fitness instructor just ahead, and we want to hear from you too. You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Gyms in Connecticut remain open, but how we exercise has changed because of safety guidelines in the pandemic. Now, do you still go to the gym or do you zoom into a fitness class these days? We want to hear from you. Join the join the conversation at 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Uh, joining us now is a fitness instructor about how she's working with clients while also taking coronavirus precautions. Heather Labby is on Zoom with us. She's membership and wellness director at the YWCA in New Britain, Connecticut. Heather, welcome to where we live. Good morning. Thank you, Lucy. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, tell us, uh, you've been working at the Y uh, for a while. What has it been like uh, working at this facility that also does a lot more than just uh, fitness instruction? But now that we're in a pandemic, uh, you know, how do you engage uh, with the same people in your community? Well, we started 2020 um, hoping for increases in membership. We had lots of big plans for events, and of course, that all changed in March. Um, In about a day, we turned into a completely online facility because we did shut down entirely for two weeks um, and really hit social media. We created a fitness group where we interacted with members daily. We had videos up very quickly on our uh, YouTube channel that led in our clients and our members through a variety of different formats, uh, kickboxing and bar and yoga. And then I would say probably within a couple of weeks, we had a robust online presence with Zoom classes, about two or three a day that we have maintained. Um, but we certainly have lost a lot of members um, and we're fully open again now but it is very different. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kat tweeted at us and said that uh, she used to take group classes at her local YMCA. She said it always mm-hmm. felt like family. These days, it gets more and more difficult to do so, especially with the masking requirement. And then yeah. uh, she uh, references what you know we hear from 
uh, doctors in our state and others about uh, one way to stop COVID is to close gyms. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about how you message that with the people that you know still want to go to your YWCA that are worried about COVID. So we have significantly cut our hours so that we're not interacting with any of the other public that are coming into our facility, because as you referenced, we're also a child care facility and we have lots of programs for children and adults in the community. So we only open our fitness center when daycare is completely done. And then we have some senior only hours as well where uh, so that we're making sure to keep those folks particularly safe. We only allow five members into the fitness facility at a time and they need to pre-register so that we know when they're coming and who they'll be interacting with so for contact tracing. Uh, we clean the gym every day before any of our members come in and then we clean it again when they leave. We also always have an attendant in the facility uh, to make sure that protocols are being taken care of. We've divided the fitness, the actual room into six blocks where folks, when they come in, they pick one of those blocks that includes a cardio machine and some weight training, and they stay in that block uh, for the entirety of their visit. Cat mm. reference, you know, it's hard to exercise with a mask. You know, how, mm -hmm. how have you seen that among your members? Well, you know, uh, up until a few weeks ago, the guidelines allowed for folks to have their mask off as long as they were social distance. And that, that worked well. Now we are certainly requiring the mask all the time when they're exercising. And what we're telling members is to continue to, to do their exercise, stay safe. You know, if that means interacting with us simply online or coming in when they see that there's only one other person registered to be in or, or however they want to manage that, but they, they definitely have to keep the mask on. So what we've told them is, you know, maybe reduce the intensity of their workout. We've even done that with our group fitness classes. For instance, right now we're just not offering any indoor cycling classes. It would be nearly impossible to follow the guidelines. And in the interest of keeping everyone safe, we've switched to less intense formats. So we have more Pilates, more yoga. Uh, we're focusing on those types of formats to keep mm -hmm. everyone safe. Uh, we mentioned uh, Zoom programming early and that's something that you had to shift to uh, pretty quickly. Uh, is it difficult to keep people engaged? I was talking with a coworker who <laughs> says that he Zooms in with his personal uh, fitness instructor in the morning and sometimes he has the kids join him as well. <laughs> Yeah, we have found it actually to be quite engaging. I think some of our staff have identified that they really don't enjoy it and they, they, they do have trouble keeping folks engaged. And then there are others like myself. I've learned one of the, the bright uh, shining uh, sort of <laughs> the silver lining for COVID for me has been that I've learned I really do enjoy the online interaction. And so I'm finding that to be a lot of fun. But you know, there's so much content out there and on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook, it's so easy to interact with us. And we just try to keep it very comfortable, very conversational and uh, changing up our routines so that we do keep everyone engaged. One thing you we hear. spent some time, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. One, t one thing we did take some of the time early in our shutdown to do was um, train all of our fitness staff to be trauma informed. And um, that has been really helpful because COVID is a, is a stress we cannot get away from. And so I think our fitness staff has turned that into something that is being used by our membership to be uniquely engaging. Well, you're hearing uh, Heather Labby again, membership and wellness director at the YWCA in New Britain, Connecticut, as we talk about how people are still trying to make time for exercise, even in the pandemic. We'd love to hear how you're doing it as well, uh, whether it's you're still going to the gym or you're taking advantage of zooming in to some fitness classes. The number is 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Marlon's calling in from West Hartford. Hi, Marlon. Oh, it doesn't look like Marlon's there. Uh, he says that uh, he, in our notes here, that he was a member of a gym, a swimmer, and they only allow one swimmer per lane so he feels safe. And so that's an example, again, Heather, of, of ways that uh, gyms are trying to make sure that, you know, people feel safe, but also still finding a way to exercise. Absolutely. 
Uh, when you talked about trauma informed, uh, like we think about how fitness instructors are engaging uh, with clients. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So trauma informed simply is recognizing that folks come into any type of exercise experience with all of their stress and are generally seeking some relief from that stress through activity, through exercise. And we wanted our fitness instructors and our fitness staff or personal trainers to really have an understanding of that and recognize that interacting socially with others, particularly with coronavirus and all of the fear that that brings can really trigger people to have a stress response or even a trauma response while they're exercising or as they're you know moving through a class and so we've tried to be very thoughtful about that we have a trauma-informed yoga program that we collaborate with our sexual assault crisis services at the y we do that weekly on zoom uh, with chair yoga but we thought why not in just push that information and that training out to all of our, our fitness services. And we've seen a lot of tremendous feedback from that. People are really enjoying the change. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that feedback, feedback and how people have responded. I think they feel more taken care of. They know that a lot of thought is being put into the playlists that we're using, the movements that we're doing so that it's very accessible. We hear from our members through um, engagement in Facebook or just in conversations as they're coming in and out of the facility, that they feel very welcomed. They feel like they can um, you know, include a friend in the Zoom classes because they know that we're not going to ask them to do movements or um, you know, do exercises that are going to be beyond their capacity or you know that we're going to be using music that is maybe offensive or too loud but we've really put a lot of thought into making sure everyone is comfortable and um, able to participate that's important because when you think about all those times where you might have been new to a gym heather mm -hmm. and uh, you feel uncomfortable maybe yes you're in the back of the fitness class so people can't see that you're still uh, struggling with learning some of the uh, the moves and coordination but if people are comfortable they're more likely to want to sign up and to stick with the exercise plan correct and i think acknowledging that is really key i've been in professional fitness for 15 years and coming upon the trauma-informed yoga training really brought this to the top of mind for me. It was something I'd never um, come in contact with in the fitness industry, being really thoughtful about, I mean, we'll talk, we had talked about, you know, how do we make people feel more comfortable, but never any formal training. And what does that really look like? And where is that coming from in the autonomic nervous system? So we've really trained our staff. They understand the difference between stressors and stress and the stress response and how exercise is an evidence-based way to manage that stress response. But if we're making coming to the exercise an additional stressor, then we're not meeting our, our goal. Mm. Do you have any advice for those of us who might have fallen off the bandwagon, so to speak, uh, Heather? <laughs> Absolutely. We've got so much going on. Should we feel guilty if we're not <laughs> exercising? There is a lot. I would say, you know, number one, turn towards yourself with kindness and compassion. Uh, coronavirus is a stressor that we cannot fight, flight, or freeze our way out of. And so it's really chronic and it may be showing up in your mood. It may be showing up in your ability to get to class or even perform once you get there. So um, if you're uncomfortable going to classes, please check out the YWCA. We've got plenty of options for you to interact with us online at social distance or, you know, geez, Google um, the, the format that you're looking for, but start right where you are. Um, don't wait. Know that exercise definitely will help boost your immunity and your mood, especially with the darkness and uh, the upcoming coronavirus, um, you know, continuing to be part of our lives. But there's plenty of ways to interact. Um, even with Zoom, we have some of our members that come in and they, they don't turn on their camera. We tell them that is totally fine. Uh, it's a perfect way for them to interact and know that they're not being judged and they get to still be social. So find a way in and get started. Don't wait another day. <laughs> Well, thank you, Heather Labby, Membership and Wellness Director at the YWCA in New Britain, Connecticut. We appreciate uh, you coming on and making us feel a little bit better. <laughs> 
Such a pleasure. Anytime. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Now, how we exercise and how often has changed. Coming up, we're going to talk about the challenges of becoming physically active again if you're a COVID survivor. You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're focused on fitness for this part of the show. Obviously, schedules have changed in this pandemic. Ilana is calling in from West Hartford. Ilana, are you still part of a gym? Um, hi. No, I am no longer part of, part of a gym. Um, I uh, We left the gym as soon as the pandemic began and bought a Peloton. How's that going for you? It is amazing. We, uh, my husband is on it every morning. I'm on it every day. Our kids are both into the classes, and um, we're all just feeling like this is this was. It was a very, it was a serious investment, but it was definitely worth it for us. Well, we're glad that you're able uh, to find an alternate uh, to the gym. It sounds like it's going well. Thank you, Ilana, for joining us. Now, we wanted to talk a little bit about the people who've had COVID and how uh, sometimes relearning how to speak and walk uh, and with breathing can be difficult. So how does someone with who had COVID get back into exercise? Uh, joining us now on Zoom, Corey Podelsky, physical therapist at Gaylord Specialty Healthcare in Wallingford, Connecticut. Hi, Corey. Hi, good morning, Lucy. Thanks for having me. So over the last several months, have you seen patients that are recovering from COVID? What have they been experiencing? Uh, yes, we've definitely been seeing post-COVID patients. Um, I myself actually had the unique experience of working inpatient um, at Gaylord Specialty Healthcare in Wallingford and watching some of those folks more acutely uh, transition through their rehab process um, because we had shut down an outpatient. So I was working in the hospital with some of these folks, uh, weaning down from ventilators and oxygen. And then uh, now we're back in outpatient. So now I've been able to see some of those same folks transition through an outpatient program as well. Um, and the complaints are really, um, are really a little bit all over the board. For the most part, the things people have the most difficulty with are returning to their daily life. Mm -hmm. um, for some, Things like going to work or doing house chores or doing yard work can be a challenge. Um, and not only is it, uh, you know, a musculoskeletal toll, but it's a psychological toll as well. They're having they're having trouble re-entering their lives again. Hmm. Uh, knowing that, and if somebody was pretty physically active before getting COVID, that must be a real struggle uh, that they can't get right back to what they love doing, Corey. Yeah, absolutely. And um you know, generally, there's a few different categories of these patients that we're seeing. Um, uh, some of the survivors of COVID might be athletes. They might have been um, younger adults or, or uh, you know, middle-aged adults who are, who are athletes. Um, some are just, uh, you know, working age, trying to get back to their jobs, maybe trying to get back to uh, a regular exercise program. Um, and then there's some who... Uh, who maybe have had a little bit more severe of an infection. So uh, maybe they were active beforehand, but now they are, uh, they're having quite a bit of difficulty again with just returning to their activities of daily living. Mm. Um, and it's, it's really a, a difficult transition to make because again, those are, uh, those, these are life-changing events um, mm. that potentially that these people are having. So how do you guide them uh, to try to get back to, to where they were, knowing that they're having these symptoms now, uh, Corey? Uh, certainly. Um, a little bit, uh, it depends a little bit. If it's someone who's had a more severe infection, um, so again, things like chest pain, body aches, potentially requiring oxygen or requiring hospitalization, um, very often those folks are being referred to a pulmonary rehab program um, or a cardiac rehab program. The, the reason for this is because of uh, the severity of COVID-19 and, and things that we're kind of learning um, every day is the effects can be widespread. So they can be purely pulmonary or they can, um, we're seeing things like myocarditis or blood clots or things like that. So there is the risk of, of prolonged effects after COVID-19. So if you are someone who has had a more severe infection, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely recommended to, to be followed for a period of time of up to, to six months to a year after your infection. Mm -hmm. But for those with a more mild infection, um, I would say it's a, a little bit safer to start back into an exercise program. It's managing the intensity is what's going to be important. So, mm. you know, we, we generally recommend uh, a week to a month of, of lower level stretching and light strengthening activities. You know, someone who's recovering and is maybe a week or two out from this infection and their symptoms are slowly going away. We certainly wouldn't advise going into a, a very high intensity situation because there's just a lot we don't know about the disease and you could have some silent, um, you know, processes going on. So a uh, slow return is generally what we recommend. Um, but in, you know, in our physical therapy sessions, we try to keep it very goal oriented. Uh, if you're someone who wants to get back to exercise, you know, we'll design a plan to, to be able to get there, whether it takes a month or six months. If you're someone who just wants to get back to doing your daily tasks like cooking and cleaning and, um, or going to work, then again, it, using a, a goal oriented approach can, can help mm -hmm. folks stay motivated and get to where they wanna be. Now, I understand that uh, there are some support groups for people who've had COVID and are recovering. What can you tell us, Corey? Uh, yes, so we have a COVID support uh, survivors support group at Gaylord. Um, as far as I know, it is uh, generally for folks who have recovered through uh, the Gaylord uh, doors, if you will. Um, but I believe there has been some talk about opening up to the public as well. Um, this is nice because, again, seeing things from an inpatient perspective, too, the, the process has taken a toll on a lot of people and some of these uh, patients, they didn't have anyone necessarily from their family um, to rely on because the hospitals were closed to visitors. So it, it was very challenging to see some of these folks struggle with that aspect of things. So I think the support group has been great um, to see not only the effect that it's had on patients, but the patient's uh, caregiver or loved ones, um, because again, it, it's been life changing for a lot of people. Mm. And for people who still want to be active, but as it gets colder, it's, you know, you want to try to stay in. A lot of people uh, don't like to, to do some of the outdoor activities that they once did, say, in July and August. And so how would you advise them, Corey, uh, to try to, to stay active and when people may not feel comfortable going into a gym? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I was ha uh, glad to hear folks like Heather uh, talking about their Zoom options and things like that. Um, and, and really trying to change people's lives that way. Um, but, you know, if you're someone who's looking to get back in, into activity, I, I first must say that if you had a more severe infection and you were hospitalized or you required oxygen, you really should be followed up uh, with a medical provider. Um, they'll do things like look at blood work, look at uh, some, some cardiac testing and things like that to make sure you're not at risk for, for additional problems. But again, if you're look, if you're a more milder infection and you you know you had a some cold or flu type symptoms that that went away within a week or so, my advice would be to start with some lower level activities. You can certainly use things around the home. Um, you know, I like to think exercises and, and general movements. So mm -hmm. a squatting type movement is good. Um, you know, some people don't like the word squatting, but you got to be able to get out of a chair every day, right, or get it on and off the toilet. So even just sitting in an uh, on and off of a chair um, will count as a squat initially. You can use a countertop to do push-ups or things like that. You can, you know, grab the soup cans. That's like a two pound weight and do some arm lifts and things like that. Uh, you know, we know it's well documented the benefits of exercise on your immune system. Um, so for those without COVID, you know, I would say staying inside uh, and exercising is certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. But for those recovering, I think, uh, I think you can certainly do a lot inside with, yeah. with very low equipment. Well, Corey Podelski, again, is a physical therapist at Gaylord Specialty Healthcare in Wallingford. Thank you, Corey. Thanks very much. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking with the co-chair of the Connecticut's Vaccine Advisory Committee about how the COVID-19 vaccine will roll out in our state. We hope to hear from you. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Test Terrible.